Elizabeth Smart back in the news, saying she was sexually assaulted on a plane, targeted in midair. She's here, revealing her ordeal and how she's helping others to fight back. Plus, the latest update on the autistic eight-year-old boy who was left to freeze to death in his garage, allegedly by the hands of his father. The boy's former nanny is here, revealing disturbing details from inside the home where the little boy died. Coming up next, Season 11 starts now. Elizabeth Smart became a household name when she was kidnapped from her home as a young teenage girl. Today, in her own words, Elizabeth shares her story about recently being sexually assaulted on an airplane. How could the unimaginable happen again? It's been 18 years since Elizabeth made national headlines after being abducted from her Utah bedroom at just 14 years old. After nine long months of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse at the hands of strangers, she was miraculously rescued and reunited with her family. Elizabeth's gift is to share her story to help others stay safe. And that's why she's speaking out today about what happened on an airplane and how it changed her forever. Please welcome back to the show, Elizabeth Smart. You're choosing to share what happened on this airplane. Again, it was brave to do it the first time. Again, to revisit this, I, I appreciate what you're doing for all of us. Take us back to that fateful flight. What happened? Well, I mean, it started off just like any other flight. You got on, and I felt so lucky because I got upgraded to first class. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time for me, so I was pretty excited. And I remember just sitting down in my seat. I was pretty tired, and as soon as I sat down on my seat, I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And I was in the seat that was next to the window, so there was me in my window seat, there was a vacant seat when I fell asleep, and then the aisle. Mm -hmm. And there was maybe 45 minutes left in the flight, when I jerked awake because I felt someone's hand on my inner thigh and they were rubbing my inner thigh. So when I jerked awake, I looked at the man who was sitting next to me and I mean, you're in first class, you've got a pretty big armrest in between you. It was clearly not accidental. Mm -hmm. And I jerked awake and I looked at him and I waited for him to say sorry or excuse me or some reason as to why he was rubbing my inner thigh. And he didn't say anything. He just looked at me, didn't take his hand off me, left his hand on me. And I just sat there for a second thinking, what do I do? I froze. And I mean, finally, I picked up his hand and took it off me. And the rest of the flight, I just sat there thinking, My what goodness. do I do? What do I do? I mean, if I reach up to you know, hit the call button for the flight attendant to come, I mean, I'm exposing the whole what well, would have been left side of my body. If I get up and walk by him, I'm exposing my back or my butt or my front. I mean, I don't want him to touch me again. And I just, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't know if I have the confidence to start screaming in the middle of a flight. I mean, I, I just froze. And then I started, I, I, I was really angry over what had happened. And then I was angry at myself because I kept thinking, I'm Elizabeth Smart. I should know what to do. I mean, I travel all the time and I speak all the time. And I talk about the importance of saying no and drawing boundaries and knowing that I have the right to, to defend myself even before something happens and yet I'm not doing anything. So uh, once again, you sit in your seat, there's no one there, you fall asleep, you wake up and there's a guy, a stranger next to you who you haven't seen before, he hasn't acted any bizarre ways but you didn't know who he was anyway. What did he do when you took his hand and put it back on his side of the, of the armrest? Nothing, nothing. Didn't say a word to me, didn't apologize, didn't, he just didn't do anything. He just kinda sat back and continued on with the flight and when the flight was over, in my mind I was still like waiting for something, I don't know, and he just got up and got off the flight and I mean I got up and got off the flight and called my husband and I was angry and upset and I mean I just, I still, I mean, to this day, what was he thinking? What, why did he think that was okay? Why did he think he could do that? Do you think he knew that you were Elizabeth Smart? 
I would like to say I look this glamorous all the time, <laughs> but I don't. Um, I mean, on the flight, I had, you know, leggings on, I had a sweatshirt on, I had a baseball cap on, and I mean, I was like slumped up against the window sleeping. So I, I have a hard time thinking that he did. So I want to just understand what went on in those last 45 minutes of the flight, because I think that's really why you're here to talk about how you reacted and, and how we naturally react in that setting. Because what happened to you was very typical, very common. 45 minutes before the end, you take this guy's hand and you move it off your chair, but he's assaulted you. Yeah. And you were asleep half the time, so you don't even know what he was trying to do or what he even did. What do you do to process what went down? And, and as you look back on it, the fact that you, you can freeze, fight, right, or flee. You, you can't run away in a plane. No. Right? Fighting was your option or freezing, both of which are very normal, well-documented, and understandable. You chose one over the other. As you juggle this in your mind, how do you make sense of that? I mean, it wasn't even a conscious thought. It was just instinct. And as I have thought about it since then, I mean, that clearly is what I default to, is freeze. I mean, the night I was kidnapped out of my bed, when I woke up to a knife at my neck, I, I mean, I didn't try to run away, I didn't fight back, I just froze. And uh, that's exactly what happened again on this plane. I, I woke up feeling threatened and I froze. So the rest of the flight. Did, did, that, did that surprise you? That I froze again? Yeah. Yeah, and it made me a little bit angry with myself because I mean, I, I, I'm an advocate for survivors. I talk about the difference between, you know, rape and sexual violence versus consensual sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all topics that I'm very comfortable talking about and, you know, talking about taking care of yourself and boundaries. And yet in that moment, once again, I froze. This is why I love you. I really do, because you're honest. Because most of us would have frozen. That what you're going through is what we all go through. It's a natural human response for most of us and guys and, you know, and women. So, so you're sitting there 45 minutes, and please don't beat yourself up because I, I, I know you're not alone. That's why it's so important to have you here today. What goes through your mind? How do you process this guy next to you? I, I understand you can't move. You're sort of stuck there. Did you avert your eye? Did you start making plans on how to get him back? What, how, what, what did you, how'd you make sense of it? I, I don't know if I actually ever did make sense of it because the rest of the flight, in my mind, all I could think of was I've got to do something. And it wasn't until I was off the plane that I was like, well, that's it. I'm going to I'm going to file a complaint with mm -hmm. Delta, and um, and then I followed it up later with a complaint to the FBI. Good for you. And wh what did your husband say when you called him? How did they console you, or what did you do to console yourself? <laughs> well, my my husband he's he's the greatest thing in my life. I don't always appreciate him, <laughs> but he is, and. Um, I mean, he sat there, he tried to calm me down. He said, okay, Elizabeth, like, well, what are you gonna do now? And, and so I told him, well, I think I'm gonna write a complaint into Delta. And he was like, yeah, I think you should. And then, and then he's like, are you gonna follow it up? And I had a moment's hesitation of, I had a hesitation on following it up or not. Um, Why? Because at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to he said, she said. And as far as I knew, nobody else had seen what had gone on. So it's basically my word against his word. And as I think a, as a victim, you start sort of not justifying what they did, but giving yourself reasons as to maybe why he did what he did. Or I don't know, you just go through and say, well, you know, it wasn't like he was actually touching or fondling my breasts or my genitals. It was just my inner thigh. So... Is it really that big of a deal? Is it really that serious that I should follow it up? I mean, I've been raped. I've been sexually abused. Like, between the two, I know which one's worse because I've already experienced that. So is it really worth following it up? And I mean, my family had some other things going on at the time and I didn't want to draw more attention to myself. And ultimately, as I sat there and thought about it, thinking if this guy is this brazen to do that to me yeah. in, in a public place, what is he doing behind closed doors? What has he already done? Or what will he potentially might do if I don't do something? And at the very least that I can hope 
is that if he, I mean, if nothing else happens, I hope the FBI pardon me, but scare the hell out of him. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, you made the right decision, and many would have cowered from it. But I think your thought process is 100% on target. And I actually got curious about this. I wonder how often does this behavior happen. So there's a recent database, by the way, from the FBI, says that sexual assaults on planes are on the rise. There were 119 cases in 2019. That's a lot of people. Because you know what? He can't get away either. A lot of people would say, I'm not going to do it here. Because I'm maybe behind closed doors I'll do it, but I'm not going to molest this woman here. But obviously this showman doesn't have that you know, internal... A, a way of figuring out what right and what wrong is, and that dividing line is just for him. Are we doing enough to protect women by educating men? Do you think the average guy gets this tale at all, especially when it comes to sexual violence? I think there are many great um, advocates for women who are men. I think there are many men who, who care deeply about the safety and the comfort of women and girls. But, I mean, unless you're a woman, how can you really know what it's like to plan your running routes yeah. around the areas that you feel safe? Or, I mean, how many times have, have I been wolf whistled at or cat, cat called at? I mean, just doing normal, boring stuff. I mean, I don't necessarily feel threatened by that, but still, like it kind of sticks in your mind and then you're kind of like, oh, there's that construction site over there and there are those yeah. construction workers over there. Yeah. I don't think I'm gonna go that way today. So what do you, what do you do, what's going to happen? What is Elizabeth Smart going to do now, as you have always been willing to empower people around you? What's your choice now? Well, when I got off the plane, I came back. And one of the suggestions that my husband made to me was that I meet with one of our friends. Um, his name's Paul. He's actually here today. And have Paul just give me a little bit of one-on-one -on -one self-defense training. And so I followed through with that. And my husband, actually, he was the, he was the aggressor in the self-defense training. <laughs> And as I was going through this training, I realized just how vulnerable I am. I mean, I like to flatter myself and think I'm a fairly fit person. I mean, I like to exercise and work out. And it was difficult for me even to get away from my husband. I mean, I also tell myself maybe he had a little bit of an advantage because he knew what was coming, but it was still difficult. And that just made me start thinking, we, we are not doing enough. I mean, like, we're not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And I'm sick of being a victim. And I'm sick of hearing stories of other women and girls being victims. I need to do something about this. Let's do that. When we come back, we have a self-defense training that Elizabeth has developed with her colleagues. We're going to share with you. If you have kids in the other room, call them in. You don't want them to miss us either. <laughs> It was a relationship that ended very poorly. I tried to ruin my life. Revenge porn. So not only were there topless photos of me, but they had added a Google map to my location. Plus, what went through your mind when you realized Eric had scammed you out of $50,000? I was numb. I was in shock. What just happened to me? Relationship horror stories just in time for Valentine's Day. All new Oz. Kidnapping survivor Elizabeth Smart is coming forward about being sexually assaulted on a plane, an event that triggered Elizabeth to take action and start a self-defense class movie called Smart Defense. Well titled, by the way. Thank you. Isaac and, and Paul are trainers from the program. So Isaac, you see, there's one important goal we got to get across. What is that? Well, I think a common fear and a common occurrence is that we have that fight or flight. Well, there's a third one that's probably even worse, and that's freeze. The worst thing you can do is nothing. And the way we get over that is repetitions. The mind is always going to default to whatever we do the most of. So if we do a lot of repetitions on the techniques that we teach, that's what you'll, you'll do when this very common occurrence happens. All right, Paul, give us a, a tactic, a technique that we might actually learn today that we can start repeating in our own minds so we're ready to fight if something happens to us. Absolutely. Isaac, if I can borrow you. Absolutely. There's a few fundamentals that we teach, a couple of basic movements. Um, one thing that's incredibly common is if someone was to grab you. So if I'm stood here and Isaac was to grab my hand, whether it's one or two hand grip, basically I'm going to look for the weakest part of the grip, which is going to be between the thumb and the index finger. I'm going to turn my thumb like a hitchhiker, 
lean over, and I'm gonna pull away. Isaac's a strong guy, I'm gonna pull away anyway. Once I've pulled away, my hands are coming up because I wanna protect my head at all times. If I get knocked out, things could get really dicey, so I wanna be mindful of my head. Then if my aggressor continues, I could throw a block, then I'm gonna throw an elbow. An elbow is one of the best things that you can have in your arsenal. Throw that in, bang, sink in the knee, bang. Bang. As I'm throwing those knees, I'm trying to wind him, trying to give him something to think about, and then push away, creating distance that then I can get away, because the ultimate goal is to get away. We don't want to hang around there. Distance right. equals escape. So, I can see you guys doing it because you're professionals. Elizabeth, Absolutely. let's see you do it. All right. All right. So, okay. So you've, you've, these techniques you obviously know, and you can probably, probably teach people as well. I've but. done them a few times. I'm not as graceful and as flowing as Paul and Isaac, because they obviously do it every single day. And so it's taken me it's taken me some practice to get to the shaky place that I am. But I mean, it's something that I feel very strongly about, and it's something that almost anyone can do. Okay, take it away. Whoa. Oh my goodness. Oh, no, you, you've, got, you've got it. <laughs> you definitely and have it. And then run. Give her a applause. Look, I get what you're saying. It's, it's all about building repetition and insight and feeling confidence that you control your body, you control your destiny. And my wife, Lisa, who's been, she's a you know, black belt. She does these things on me, by the way, for practice. <laughs> but she, that was her big mindset when she was learning it. She didn't want to feel small and petite and, 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 and insignificant. She wanted to own the space around her, which I'm very proud you're pushing us on. So listen, uh, you're always impressing me. All this stuff is on Smart Defense at ElizabethSpartFoundation.org. But let me speak to you for a second. If I can borrow your, your, <laughs> your, your colleague. The beautiful thing about you is when this stuff happens to you, 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 get, you don't get hardened, you get strengthened. And that's what makes Lewis Smart who you are. God bless you. Well, thank Thanks you for very speaking much. up. It means the world to all of us. Thank you very much. Right. We'll be right back. Very proud of you. And up next, a breaking news story that has the entire nation enraged. Eight-year-old Thomas Valva died after being left to sleep in a freezing cold garage in 19-degree weather. We're speaking to his former nanny in a daytime exclusive interview. She claims Thomas never should have been left in his NYPD father's custody. That's next. On today's true crime, a breaking news story that has the entire nation enraged. The cries to help save eight-year-old Thomas Valva from an alleged life of abuse fell on deaf ears. Why? Thomas was left in the custody of his father, 42-year-old NYPD officer Michael Valva, and his 42-year-old fiance, Angela Polina. The two have now been arrested for leaving little Thomas alone in a freezing cold garage, where he reportedly died of hypothermia. In a daytime exclusive interview, we're speaking to the nanny who says Thomas never should have been left in his father's custody. Long Island police responded to a 911 call early January 17th to find NYPD officer Michael Valva administering CPR to his unresponsive son, Thomas, claiming the eight-year-old with autism had fallen and lost consciousness in the driveway. Valva's story unraveled after Thomas was pronounced dead at a local hospital. Hypothermia cited as a major factor. His body temperature reportedly a shocking 76 degrees. Authorities determined Thomas was never in the driveway and his head and facial injuries were inconsistent with Valva's account. Video seized from home surveillance reportedly shows Thomas and one of his two brothers, 10-year-old Anthony, also on the autism spectrum, sleeping in an unheated garage prior to Thomas's death, without blankets and pillows, as the temperature dropped to 19 degrees. The boy's mother, Justina Zupka Valva has alleged her three sons have suffered horrific abuse since her ex-husband gained custody in 2017. Valva and his living fiance, Angela Polina, have been charged with second degree murder and have pleaded not guilty. Both are being held without bail and face 25 years to life if convicted. Join me now is CNN analyst and defense attorney Joey Jackson. Michael's two other sons, as well as Angela's three daughters, have reportedly been placed in safe environments. 
What do we know about Michael Valva and his fiancée, Angela Polina? Uh, well, I think the first thing we know is that each had uh, three children. We know that she had three girls, and apparently he had three boys. We also know that there was this custody uh, dispute, which led to him having custody. And there's some issues and questions as to repeated, repeated child uh, protective services, you know, knowing and understanding that there was a dynamic in this home that was amiss. But we also know that, look, he's a police officer, joined the in 2005, uh, certainly suspended now without pay as it should be, and he's facing 25 years to life, and so is she. Just go back to the beginning, say, why didn't the mom have protective custody in the first place of her son? Yeah, so apparently what we're learning, Doc, is this. You have to undergo a psychological evaluation before a judge in a family court setting would permit you to have custody, and it's only fair. When you're dealing with children, certainly you want to make sure that neither of the parents are psychologically impaired, that both have the ability to provide for the care of the children, and apparently Apparently she refused, right, to, to go into this evaluation unless it was videotaped. As a result of that, they did not award her custody. Why does she care so much about a videotape? Because of the fact that, listen, if you have an officer, a police officer, who may be well-connected and who may be favored by our system, her position was, let us do this and do it properly. You want to evaluate me? Evaluate me. But let's ensure that the world can see it's not behind closed doors. Because at the end of the day, doctor, if I'm having a private evaluation, the doctor could say whatever they want, whenever they want. If it's videotape, the world can see. So she had some concern about that. Notwithstanding her not having custody, she repeatedly sounded the alarm. Obviously, those alarm bells went unanswered. How many times was CPS called? 17 times as it related to young Thomas, who's now dead. That's crazy, right? 17 different times, allowing them to know that something was amiss. And just to be clear, there's a history here. They were put under supervision, right? They being, uh, you know, this cop who's now in jail uh, and apparently his fiance. And it, based upon that super supervision, Child Protective Services was on the trail that apparently nothing resulted from. And again, I'm just reading this, but I've gotten pretty smart on this case. There were calls from the school. There were worries that the yes. children were uh, either bruised or unkempt or... Hungry. Yeah. Going to school hungry, going to school dirty. And apparently, the school psychologist thought enough to and was motivated enough to get involved because, listen, school psychologists believe something was wrong. All right, so reports say that Valva and Polina left Thomas in an unheated garage overnight. The temperatures that evening dropped to 19 degrees. Reportedly, his body was 76 degrees when he was taken to the hospital. I do heart surgery. I'll cool patients down in order to preserve their brain. We don't go to 76 degrees, even in a monitored setting. Plus, Thomas reportedly had suffered head and facial injuries. And there was crucial audio and video evidence from the home surveillance cameras that support the alleged abuse claims. Have you heard these tapes, or do you know what they may have captured? Yeah, the, you know, th this is really troubling. And apparently, when you have these home surveillance, they capture a lot. They captured not only the children shivering in this garage, but get this, they're sleeping on the ground of that garage. They're sleeping without pillows. They're sleeping without covers. It is horrific. Beyond that, there's also audio, which would suggest that the stepmom says, well, what are you doing to the cop, the father, Mr. Valva? And he says, what does it look like? I'm suffocating him. So there's a lot of compelling information on these tapes that's gonna be used as exhibit A, B, and C to really prosecute and get justice, if you can call that, for young Thomas. I mean, it feels like it's the defenseless case. I mean, how is this going to be presented to court? How would a jury not find this yeah. couple guilty? I, I think it, the defense has a really uphill battle. I just think it's a very difficult case to overcome for the defense. Prosecution has the goods. And again, you know, we talk about this notion of justice. What does justice mean? When you have an eight-year-old who's dead, there were warning bells signed, uh, you know, just do something about it, help. 17 calls from everyone. And the fact is, is that it didn't make a difference. And uh, here we are. Joy, I want to hear from that nanny. Up next, the nanny of the eight-year-old Thomas is here speaking out in a daytime exclusive and why she says his father should never, ever have had custody. That's next. Every Friday on Oz, it's Celebrity Superfan Takeover. This week, spend Valentine's Day with Morris Chestnut. We solve some food fight feuds driving couples crazy. You have to fold no. it. That's coming up Friday.
We're back discussing the tragic breaking news case of eight-year-old Thomas Valba freezing to death in his father's garage. Thomas was allegedly abused for years by his 42-year-old NYPD father and his fiance, who now are being held in jail without bond for his murder. Speaking out on this unthinkable act is Thomas's former nanny, Amanda. Thank you for being here. No problem, anytime. I know these are difficult topics to discuss, but you were close to this child. You were with him 2017, 18, knew him as well as anybody. Why did you decide to leave the job? Um, it was really because every day I was coming home crying to my parents because there was nothing more I could do. CPS was already involved in the life, so there was nothing I could do to, you know, make that further step. Like, they were already coming there, interviewing the boys, so every time, like, I would talk to my parents, you know, they would be like, Amanda, you have to let CPS do their job. What, what were you observing in your time with Thomas and the rest of the children that was alarming to you? They were all verbally abusive. If they didn't finish their food or they got caught throwing out their food, you know, they got in trouble and they were told to go sit on the couch and they weren't allowed to get up until, you know, she said and she told them, you know, I don't care if you have to go to the bathroom, you know, you're to remain on that couch until said otherwise. And she's trying to portray herself as like this victim of Mike. Meanwhile, she was the runner of it. Mike followed in her footsteps. So she's trying to play this like innocent card when it, it was always her screaming, you know? And both Thomas and Anthony had autism. So, you know, they had accidents a lot. They didn't understand a lot of things. Like when you talk to him, he looks down at the floor and she would get mad about that and, you know, scream. And he wouldn't come downstairs in the morning and say good morning. and you know, she would curse at him. She would be like, well, F you then, like, you know, it, it, but you're talking to a boy with autism, you know. Did you ever see injuries to these children when you were with them? Um, I did. I witnessed actually Thomas telling me a story about, he said that um, Justina's grandfather was biting him and I seen the bite mark and it was almost like now that I look back to the videos and everything that everybody's posting, you see it, like you could hear Mike in the car chanting like, we love daddy, we love Angela, you know, we hate mommy. So it's like whatever was beaten to their head was beaten so bad that they were telling me like graphic stories. And I met Justina, she's a wonderful lady. Like. It's so, I wish we could have connected before all of this happened. Like this was reported a year ago to CPS that he was sleeping in a garage, that they were being starved. And now here we are a year later talking the same reason he died. So, you know, I think a little more should have, if CPS would have done their job, I think Thomas would still be here with us. Oh my goodness. You know, Andrew had come to me one day and told me he was cold and like the house always stayed warm so it didn't really make sense to me and I'm like, well, why were you cold last night? It's always so hot in here and Angela was right there to be like, oh, Mike lowered the heat last night. So like she always was, you know, there to kind of veer everything. Every time I feel like the boys tried to give me a signal, she was there to like make it seem like it was nothing. Did you ever see Michael abusive to the kids? He, I witnessed him come home one day um, when Anthony had an accident and Angela had made him sit on the couch until, you know, Mike got home and he had picked him up by the arm off the ground and carried him up the stairs into his bedroom and, you know, stuck him in his bedroom and told him that he had to stay there until it was said otherwise. What do you have to say to Angela? What do you have to say to Michael right now? What should they know? Them, personally, I wouldn't even waste my words to say anything to them. I could only hope that, you know, what they did to that child happens to them. And if maybe not that particular thing, I could only hope that when they get their sentence and wherever they go, they get the torture that they put these little kids through. Listen, thank you for, for speaking out. Anytime. Thank you for putting yourself at risk to talk openly about what you experienced. God bless you. Thank you. We'll be following this case as it develops. We'll be right back. The Dish on Oz is back, and these ladies are stealing everybody's heart. What better way to spice things up this Valentine's Day than with some irresistible recipes? Oh, we've got cocktail steak and chocolate. 
doesn't get better than that. <laughs> Stay tuned. We're back with the dish on eyes. Jamaica Gale and my daughter Daphne are here. <laughs> and we are spicing up your Valentine's Day. We are combining chocolate and spice with some delicious recipes you're gonna wanna make for V-Day. We're starting it up with some hot, oh, no, we are hot for these sriracha fudge brownies, you guys. Ooh. And we're kicking it all off with a cocoa rub steak and a spicy cocktail to go with it. Jerika, please tell us what we are drinking today. Oh, of course, I will, because we are setting the mood. All right, so follow me. This is a hot, bloodied spritz, if you will. So we'll start with, oh yes, it is ooh worthy. So we start with a little bit of jalapeno infused honey. Ooh, ooh. ooh nice ooh. drip there. So it's a little sweet. Wow. And then some, oops, there we go, blood orange juice. Nice. And then you gotta have a little bit of bourbon in your life. Now we're talking. <laughs> a little bit of bourbon, a little more. And then you're just gonna top it off with some club soda. There we go. Okay. So she is very pretty. And I do like to say, let me move all this out so I can bring this to you guys. It's a little bit of sweet, it's a little bit of sexy, and it's a little spicy, like the three of us. Uh -huh. Goodness. <laughs> I want all of that. I want Gardening. all of yes. that. And so you garnish, garnish, little... garnish, garnish with a little blood That's orange. Ready? Blood or how take, about take, these take. guys? How about some doctor? Garnish. I thought you were putting the, what happened to my chocolate just, jalapeno? Just, just don't worry, I'm not depriving you. Oh. This is a chocolate covered okay. jalapeno, you guys. What? Okay. Oh my gosh, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about chocolate with jalapeno pepper? Cheers, I, yes, cheers. 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 Yes. cheers. Happy Valentine's yes. Day. Happy Valentine's Day. I think between this drink and this jalapeno, I'm gonna end up with hot flashes, but in a good way, <laughs> yeah. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a cool down, it's a bite and a cool, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. feel and a drink at the moment. Mm, the drink is good. Well, that it was a southern pour, great. but this yeah, is a brilliant you. idea. <laughs> Ooh. In fact, these chocolate jalapenos, while you guys are making steak over here. Mm. Audience, you want some of these? Mm. Yeah. I'll be Get back in, in a little while. Oh, oh Jamaica. Wow. This I is just so got good. Jalapenos, jalapenos. I just got my bourbon. Oh, my <laughs> you Yum. got it. All right, so Let's delicious share these cocktails oh, to start goodness. us off with. The audience is getting a few of those poppers, so and please enjoy those, Gail. Please oh, yeah. uh, dish us the details on the steak that we rip it up. Cocoa rub steak. Yes, here, come over here. I'm going to show mm. you how to make it. So I actually make this rub for a lot of things. I can use it on ribs, I can use it on steak, I can use it on pork chops. I have some black pepper, smoked paprika. Ribs would be good, yeah, you're mm. right. Brown sugar. Nice. Some Sweet. cumin. Mmm. Some mm, ancho chili. Oh, oh wow, nice so good. Smoky heat right there. It's so spicy, Gail, I love uh, it. You know, I try. For you, Jamaica, I try. <laughs> so spicy. Some salt, and then some cocoa. And when you mix it together, you just want to toss it together. This is a great rub. You can make it and keep it in your pantry and then use it on everything. But I'm going to rub it on some sirloin steak. Mm. You know, there's salt in it, so you don't need to also season. And I'm going to rub it all over. And then I'm just going to sear it. I have a really hot yeah, it's pan that hot. I've, I've yes. uh, wiped with oil so that it's, it's not going to stick. All right. And these are going to sear for a few minutes. Yes. Flip them. Make sure that they are cooked to your liking. You know, oh, I like a nice oh, medium, medium rare. And then you can put them on a board. Let them rest for a few minutes. You definitely want to Look give them about oh. seven minutes of resting. Make sure all those juices stay in. And then slice it. This is like a beautiful way to simply present it. I'm going to put a little bit, oh. of course, sea salt on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that even smells drizzle. like love, honey. This drizzle. is what you should come home to. So, well, oh. OK. Uh, this, so this is what Jamika wants. Oh, you guys, somebody make this for me, please, <laughs> on Valentine's Day. <laughs> what do you mean, somebody? Your husband. Uh, <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. I did not marry my husband for his cooking skills. Oh, no, not that's not this. his oh, forte. Absolutely not, no. OK. <laughs> Get in there, We'll follow taste. up on a question with that later. <laughs> Now, uh, do you guys celebrate Valentine's Day? What are you doing? What are you doing for it? Am I just eating it like caveman? Style? Yeah, oh, we or? are. Yes. This is how you want to eat this delicious steak. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. Gail, you better be what my Valentine's Day. Oh, this day. Oh, oh, I'll be your Valentine. Mm. 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 Now, what are you that doing for Valentine's cocoa. Day? Mm. So, you know, it's funny, I feel like, you know, John and I, before we had kids, I feel like we celebrated more. Although it was so long ago in, in my brain space, I can't really remember. I know, that's but, the thing. But the kids love Valentine's Day. They make a big deal about it in school, and they're really excited about Obviously, it's the day they get chocolate. They're excited about it. Mm -hmm. So last year, I set up this big surprise for them. I stayed up so late. I made doilies on the wall with clues. I put those little chocolate hearts and the little message hearts and everything scattered down the staircase and into the like place where I'd set up this whole breakfast for them. The whole shebang, you guys. And look what happened. Oh. 
Daddy put one here, one here, one here. One, one day, one day, one day, one day, one day. Who, who put them there? Um, Daddy did. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. Yep, you're right. Oh. It was Daddy. <laughs> Daddy just Daddy did all of that. Credit. You can't swoop in and take that credit, Dad. He's a good father. He's a great dad. You, you, but you guys, like, when I was going, growing up, we didn't have Valentine's Day. I didn't know what it was. Your mother taught me Valentine's Day. Yes, it's true. And our first it's date was true. February the 10th, so I learned fast. Oh, oh wow, my goodness. All right, when we come back, our next spicy <laughs> chocolate Valentine's Day dish, the sriracha fudge rice. Look at those babies. Oh, my. Oh. Melt in your mouth and in your fingers. It's getting hot in here. Every Friday on Oz, it's Celebrity Superfan Takeover. This week, spend Valentine's Day with Morris Chestnut. We solve some food fight feuds driving couples crazy. You have to fold no. it. That's coming up Friday. All right, so what happens when chocolate meets spice and everything nice from the Dish on Oz team? You get delicious recipes you want to make, want to make tonight, no matter whether you're celebrating V-Day or not. Is that true, Daphne? What's up? Well, I hope so. <laughs> All right, so up next, we're making, you guys, I'm going to say it slow, sriracha fudge brownies. Oh. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're combining a little bit of sweet and a little bit of heat for a novel sweet treat that you're definitely going to want to make tonight. It's not just to say you tried it, right? Sriracha and fudge and chocolate, all of it coming together. So in this double boiler here, I just have this bowl over some boiling water to heat together the butter, the, the sugar, and the cocoa. And after that's combined like here, and it's a little bit tight here, but it'll all come together. Don't worry. Trust me on this. I'm going to add in two eggs to bind it up. Plus, um, what comes next, guys? What do you think? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the spice. Yeah, yeah, yeah bring the heat. <laughs> bring that heat. And not a small amount. I'm going with like two, three tablespoons of the stuff in here. You are not scared. And, I like and that. smell that. Smell that. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that's the real deal. It's the real deal. I didn't pull any punches here. So that's going to add, yes, a little bit of heat, but also a little bit of tank. Okay, so I have my wet together here. Here I have flour, a little bit of baking soda, a little bit of salt. Just give that a quick stir and add that in with, because I want a little texture in these brownies, a nice little, about a quarter cup, I would say, of chopped walnuts. Watch your clothes. Let me throw this in there Yes, for please, you. do the Go honors. Thank you, thank no you, problem. thank you. I mean, this is a really fast recipe. That's okay. the other thing on Valentine's Day. Guys, it's gonna happen. What that means you're working. No, yeah, it <laughs> looks like you really cooked when you come home. Whatever you make these home, for, exactly, it's gonna be you, so impressive. Let me ask, do you wear an apron when you cook? As professionals, do you wear an apron when you cook or you just let your clothes go to waste? It depends on what I'm making. Mm. Yeah? yeah? Yeah, I mean, and also when I'm cooking with my kids, my daughter loves wearing an apron because it makes her feel so professional. Cute. She's really into the fold and tie, oh, so like, oh, yes. we, oh, we do, you know what I mean? She's got the technique down, wow. But, uh, but otherwise, you know, on a weeknight I get home, my clothes are dirty anyway, or I'm in my pajamas <laughs> most days, so who cares, that's right? See, that's the beauty of that's athleisure. Like yes. <laughs> always ready to cook. Uh, or Do you wear an apron at home? You know, I, I, here's a ridiculous sort of bizarre part. I own a lot of aprons, but all my clothes look like this with the, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the that's what powder everywhere. Okay, this is going to go in the oven. It co cooks up at about 325, 25, 30 minutes. Okay. Just mm. keep an eye on it because you do want it to stay nice and moist and fudgy, right? I'm a big fan of fudgy brownies. I don't want some cakey ones. Mm. That goes in. And I already made them for you guys because we what did are a little you guys taste testing. Oh, are you going to say today? Give me my wee, Kimasabi. <laughs> exactly. Hey. Who's wee? So a little bit of powdered sugar on top just to gild the lily. Feel Beautiful. the love. Nice. And that's nice for your friends, for your loved ones, for you by yourself, you know, whoever you're <laughs> celebrating with tonight. Let's right, taste that. Thanks. Let's go in. We got napkins first, so we can... Well, the, the key okay. is, are they moist? Right? They we feel want... really fudgy. They feel heavy, heavy, right? They feel heavy. Mm -hmm. I'm smelling that sriracha already. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's there. No. Well, hello there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> oh, it, it got you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it all works together. It's and annoying. you feel like you want to go back for more. Oh, like, yes. oh, but now my mouth is spicy. Let me get sweet again. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's the whole food. It's got sriracha in it. Sure. <laughs> yes, of course. So let me get cauliflower in this. Ooh, you actually, you know what? That would be kind of fun. We could sneak some black beans in here. Just get your whole day. All right. Let's not get into all. Don't ruin my Valentine's Day with black beans. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> let me ask you something, Jamaica. Have you ever experienced or celebrated a Galentine's Day? 
Oh, Galentine, like where you celebrate with all your girlfriends? All your girlfriends. Oh, yeah, because let me tell you, I was single seven years before I got married. Okay. So we would do that every year, and it starts out like, we are empowered, we don't need a man, and then by the end of the night, it's drunk texting, like, let me tell my ex, <laughs> let me give him a piece of my mind. Yes. So do not drunk text on Valentine's Day, people. Do uh, not. Do not. Oh, and one more piece of advice, because I am I got all the dating tips. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> do not do a blind date on Valentine's Day. Do not do that. It's too much pressure, and he's probably not the one, so don't do it on that blind... Don't do it on Valentine's Day. Don't do it. Yeah. No blind dates on Valentine's Wise Day. Wise advice. Yes, don't do it. Do it on the 10th, like Doc did with his wife. Yeah, there that's you go. right. Do it on the that's 10th. That's the good one. Not on the 14th. Actually, I have no. a very diabolical plan. Oh. Because tomorrow, we're actually doing a little anti-V day, our versions of Valentine's okay. Day. Okay. Right here on Dr. Rao's show, a true crime special, listen carefully, of relationship horror stories. Oh, gosh. It'll make oh. yours look tame. <laughs> so mix in with these brownies and tune in. You can find all the recipes from today on Dr. Yeah. Rao's Dr. Yeah. the Dish. We'll be right back with lots more. Give that a bite. Well, these brownies are good. Yes, we'll take I do. Brownies. I actually, I like that it starts yeah. off like a little bit was a relationship that ended very poorly. Tried to ruin my life. Revenge porn. And not only were there topless photos of me, but they had added a Google map to my location. Oh, my. That's coming up tomorrow. <laughs> we are back with the Dish at Oz. And before we go, the other thing happening this week, the reason this week is so important to Daphne and me and Mommy, she was our first child. Born this week, it's her birthday. <laughs> Surprise for her. Please uh -oh. bring it out. Ooh. Oh, what is it? What it's actually Bulls in his ice cream. Oh, oh my God. gosh. Oh, yes. Whoa. Bring it on out. Oh, wow. my God. Well, okay, do we not know how to get you a gift or what? Uh, you guys. Come you on. know me so well. This is outrageous. Okay. okay. This is, go make your, no, no, tell me while I'm Okay. Push. This is Booze and Fuse ice cream, you guys, and it's all over the grocery stores. I call this ice cream with attitude. And this is made yes. by Tipsy Scoop, okay? So we've got spiked milk chocolate chip. Mm, my we've favorite. got strawberry chocolate kiss martini and mango margarita, girl. You know we love to, to celebrate audience. your birthday. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Look at that. Right. Look at that. Make a good yeah. wish with this one. Do it, do it, do it. Yes! Keep going, keep going! Oh, wait, wait, wait! Keep going! Keep going, keep going! Woo! Oh, he got it, he got it! Thank All you, right. guys. Happy How birthday. many spoons do we get? Do is I... this 21? Is this oh, you is know, I've been waiting to be yes. able to drink for right. so long. It's All right. right. You gotta jump in this 21's one. 21's gonna be a good year, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm. So, what's your birthday wish, Daphne? You know, the thing I always wish for is health and happiness for my family. I feel like that's the first Aww. thing that always comes to your mind, you know? Yeah. And then as many pints of boozy ice cream yeah, as possible. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, happy birthday, my dear. Thank you. You were blessing us. Happy birthday. Oh. <laughs> She's completed our lives. Okay. Next one, yeah. the Dish and Oz crew is back with 99 ways to use rotisserie chicken that will Ooh. change your life. Oh, wait, and including a chicken pasta, two ways. Oh, my God, look at this. That looks so good. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. See you next time. I know you'll be here. <laughs>